He had walked those streets many times before. He was used to having people notice him. Every time he left his house, somebody recognized him. But not tonight. Tonight, as he walked along in the darkness, the only sound that accompanied him was the shuffling of his own feet and the distant chirping of crickets. The only light besides that from his lamp was the soft glow of the moon and the stars above. And as he walked along, he he thought about the seriousness of the situation. What he was doing was potentially very, very dangerous. See, his, his line of work was not normal. More than just a source of income, his job was his life. His identity, his purpose, his reputation were all wrapped up in his job. And with every step that he took, it became increasingly likely that he would lose all of it. But tonight, he was on a mission. As he thought about how he would start the conversation, questions came flooding into his mind. Who was this new teacher? Where had he come from? What was he going to do next? Nicodemus had a confession to make. He had heard the reports reports that this man had gone to a wedding in Cana and changed water into wine, reports that this man had gone into the temple in Jerusalem, made a whip out of cords, and used it to drive people out of the temple. Every day, more and more people were following this new teacher. And some of those people even said that Jesus, this new rabbi, had been sent from God. And Nicodemus was one of those people. When Nicodemus met with Jesus that night, he immediately confessed what he and the other members of the Jewish ruling council knew to be true. He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. The miracles of Jesus accomplished exactly what they were supposed to do. They grabbed someone's attention so that Jesus could share the good news of the gospel with them. But before Nicodemus was ready to hear good news, he needed to hear some bad news. Jesus replied, Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Are you familiar with the phrase, the kingdom of God? It comes up sometimes in the Bible, but it's a hard word to actually define. Jesus gives us some help. In Luke 17, he says, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is within you. The simplest way to say it is that God's kingdom is the rule of God in the hearts of his people. So if you believe in Jesus, then God dwells in your heart and you are in God's kingdom. And that's something that's true of all of us. All of us believe in Jesus and Jesus sits on the throne of our heart and he rules and we're all part of God's kingdom. That's something to thank God for and to praise him for. But sometimes there's a problem in the way that we think about why we are in God's kingdom or how we came to be Christians. Let me tell a story that I think will help illustrate this for you. A man named Mike and his wife, Charlotte, had three kids. And every Sunday, Charlotte would gather up the kids and take them to church. And every Sunday, she would try to get Mike to come with them. But Mike always said no. Over the years, Mike's family became increasingly worried about him. They tried everything they could to get him to come to church. They invited him to to Christmas Eve services and and Easter programs. They urged him to read his Bible, but Mike always said no. He was stubborn in his refusal to have anything to do with God. How do you feel when you hear something like that? Probably you feel several different things. Probably, first of all, you feel worried for Mike and where he will spend his eternity. 
And then two, you probably feel sad for Charlotte and the kids and that tough situation that they are in. And I think there might be something else there as well. Something maybe below the surface, subconscious even. Whenever I hear about someone who has been repeatedly presented with the gospel, told about Jesus, and yet they always refuse to listen to it or have anything to do with it, my sinful nature gets, gets kind of fired up and says, hey, I'm pretty good. When I heard the gospel, I decided to believe it. I decided to join God's kingdom. I'm a lot better than Mike. I'm better than a lot of people are. I am pretty good. And it becomes easy for me to give myself credit for being in God's kingdom, to think that I'm the reason that I am a Christian. Maybe the same is true for you as well. And maybe now you're thinking, well, what's, what's the big deal? You know, the, the main thing is we're in God's kingdom. Why does it matter how we got there? That's not important. But the truth is, when we give ourselves credit for being in God's kingdom, we are playing right into the devil's hand. The devil wants to take our trust and our focus off of God and to move it onto ourselves. And when we think that we are the reason that we are Christians, really, we're trusting in ourselves, aren't we? We're not trusting in God. We're having faith in our own faith. And that's exactly what the devil wants. He knows that when we put our trust in anything besides God, God's promises, it's a recipe for disaster. And it's a quick way for us to lose our faith. So giving ourselves credit for being in God's kingdom is a very dangerous thing. And that's really what Jesus warns us against today. He says, look, even if you wanted to join my kingdom, you couldn't have done it. In order to join the kingdom of God, you have to be spiritually reborn. And he tells Nicodemus, flesh gives birth to flesh. Sinful human people give birth to sinful human people. That's how it is. That's how it always has been. Human, be human beings are not capable of creating that type of spiritual rebirth that is necessary to enter God's kingdom. We, we can't do it. To me, it seems like if anyone ever could, if anyone could have found a way to be spiritually reborn and join God's kingdom on their own, I would have, I would have thought Nicodemus could do it. Here's a guy who knows the Bible as well as anyone He's a very wise man. You don't get put on the Jewish ruling council by accident. He was a very learned man. When people had questions about God or religion or life in general, they would come to Nicodemus. And not only that, but Nicodemus had the testimony of the prophets and John the Baptist that pointed to Jesus and that called for spiritual rebirth. And to top it all off, Nicodemus was talking face to face with Jesus, who was telling him, you need to be spiritually reborn. And Nicodemus couldn't even understand what Jesus was saying. It was nonsense to him. That means that you and I don't get any credit for our being in God's kingdom either. By nature, we are just like Nicodemus. We can't understand what God says to us. And by nature, we're just like Mike. We're opposed to God. We're not Christians because we decided to follow Jesus. We're not in God's kingdom because of something good that we did. The reason that we're in God's kingdom, it has nothing to do with us. But the triune God brought us into his kingdom. Each person of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they all play a role in bringing us into God's kingdom. The role of God the Father, the first person of the Trinity, is stated in John 3.16, the most famous verse of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God saw that we were outside of his kingdom. If you think of, of the kingdom of God as like an actual city with walls around it, 
we were outside of the city and the gate was closed and locked and barricaded. And you know what? We didn't want to come into God's kingdom. We liked being outside. We liked having nothing to do with God. And so God decided to send his son into the world. Now, if you had never heard of the Bible before, what would you think God would send his son into the world to do? The world was full of people who hated God, people who were by nature opposed to God and wanted nothing to do with him. To me, I would think God would send his son to punish us, to condemn us for our sins. But that's actually the exact opposite reason that God sent his son. Jesus says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God didn't send Jesus to, to punish us, but to bless us. He came not to destroy us, but to give us life and to bring us into God's kingdom. Since Nicodemus was a scholar of the Old Testament, Jesus uses a picture from the history of Israel to explain his role in all of this, to explain the role of Jesus. He says, Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus is talking about something that took place after God took the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and he was leading them to the land that he had promised to give them. But on the way, they had to wander around in the desert. And if you remember anything about the history of Israel, you know that they hated wandering around in the desert. And as happened so many times, they began to complain against God, against Moses, and to punish them, God sent poisonous snakes into their camp. And the snakes were biting people and people were dying. And they went to Moses and they said, help us, do something, talk to God for us. And so Moses did, he prayed to God and, and God said, Moses, make, make a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. So Moses did that. And any Israelite who had been bitten by a poisonous snake, instead of dying, they could look at that snake on the pole and they would live. It's a beautiful picture of what Jesus did for us, isn't it? The problem that we had was much bigger than poisonous snakes. We were outside of God's kingdom. But when Jesus was lifted up on the cross, it's like he took a wrecking ball and smashed open the gates to the kingdom of heaven. The gate is wide open because of Jesus' death. And the job of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity in all of this, is to pick us up and to bring us into God's kingdom. And he does that by giving us spiritual rebirth through our baptism. Baptism is rebirth. When, when you see someone in the front of church and the pastor takes some water and sprinkles it on their head and says, I, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, there's no thunder or lightning. There's no earthquake. The person doesn't start to glow or anything like that. There's no visible difference. But what you see when you see someone baptized is the biggest life-altering event that there is. That person has gone from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive, from being an enemy of God to being a member of God's own family, to being inside of God's kingdom. And that's what happened in your baptism. I had a professor at the seminary who said that he would tell his wife, you're the best thing that's ever happened to me, except for baptism. Not the most romantic line you've ever heard, but it's very true. Your baptism is so important. It's the most important thing that's happened to you. God gave you spiritual rebirth. He picked you up and brought you into his kingdom, made you a member of his own family through your baptism. Although you never could have done it by yourself, God brought you into his kingdom. He gave you spiritual rebirth. That's how it happened for Mike, too. Mike had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. One day, a friend came to visit him and, and shared these words from John chapter 3, 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish that ha but have eternal life. Even though by nature Mike was still hostile to God, as all of us were, the Holy Spirit overcame that hostility and gave Mike faith, a faith that trusted in Jesus as his Savior. And it seems like that's how it happened for Nicodemus as well. Did you know Nicodemus two more times in the Bible? The first time is when the Pharisees, they were accusing Jesus and attacking him, and Nicodemus stood up for Jesus. He defended him. And then, after Jesus died, Nicodemus was one of the people who helped to give Jesus a proper burial. From everything that we see in the Bible, it seems like God gave Nicodemus spiritual rebirth and brought him into his kingdom. And maybe it even happened through the words that we have in front of us today. Maybe Nicodemus was the first person to be brought to faith through the words of John 3.16. I think it's awesome how much you and I have in common with Mike and with Nicodemus. We're separated by, by huge distances and great amounts of time, but we have so much in common. All of us were by nature hostile to God and wanted nothing to do with him. But God brought each of us into his kingdom through spiritual rebirth. It's totally by grace that you and I and Mike and Nicodemus have been saved. Amen.